Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to our webinar, Crimea, Seven Years of Occupation. My name is Olesa Kromoychuk, and I'm the director of the Ukrainian Institute London, uh, which is a center for Ukraine-related educational and cultural activities. We are a registered charity, and we work to broaden knowledge about Ukraine in the UK and beyond by offering discussions and projects that explore Ukrainian history, culture, and current affairs. Okay, so let me introduce the webinar. Um, it's about Crimea as it is now and the last seven years um, since it was illegally annexed by Russia. Um, Crimea hasn't really been much in the news in the UK um, in the last few years. There's an agreement that the annexation of the peninsula was illegal, uh, but there's also a feeling that not much can be done about it right now. Um, it's difficult to visit, um, and so there's very little knowledge about what is actually happening to the population that remained in Crimea. Um, we've got some very knowledgeable guests tonight who will be able to shed some light on the state of affairs in Crimea. Um, and who will also tell us what can be done to keep the attention of the world on the, uh, the, the situation in, on the peninsula. Um, and they'll also be able to tell us why it's perhaps particularly important to draw the world's attention to the situation in Crimea now in the middle of the pandemic. And at this point, I'd like to introduce our moderator. Um, Sivgil Musayeva is a Ukrainian journalist. She is herself from Crimea. She is editor-in-chief of Ukrainska Pravda. Um, together with Ali Maliev, one of our speakers today, she co-authored a book about the leader of the Crimean Tatar people, uh, Mustafa Jimlyov. And uh, she has received numerous prizes for her achievements in Ukrainian journalism. And we are very happy to have her here. Sivgil, the, the floor is yours. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you for your interest for this topic. It's uh, very important for us, uh, Crimeans, uh, Crimean Tatars. And I think that uh, during this hour, we will receive um, thousands of questions and uh, you will better understand what actually is going on in occupied territory. And uh, I'm very happy, uh, actually, and I, I have nothing to add to, to this perfect presentation. Thank you, Lucia. Uh, but I would like to represent our speakers, today's speakers, and uh, I know them. <laughs> Uh, because actually Olesa told you that together with Alim, we were author of this book about Mustafa Jamilev. Uh, actually, we published this book four years ago, um, but uh, a lot of people still ask me <laughs> how I can buy this book, which is very, uh, uh, I, I think that <laughs> uh, it's, it's, it was an important book for Ukraine and for uh, Crimeans. Uh, and to, together with Zalim, we, was, we also founded the organization Crimea OSS at uh, the beginning of annexation, uh, annexation but we will talk about uh, this later. So Ali Maliev, Deputy Director General of the Ukrainian Institute, and uh, Anton Korinevich, uh, i also very happy to introduce you, Anton, permanent representative of the President of Ukraine in, in the Autonomous Republic of Crimea. And I think that you will receive thousands of questions today because uh, I um, strongly believe that people are very interested um, about uh, strategy of Ukraine, and you represent this strategy today. You represent uh, this opinion today. So uh, let's start. Um, occupation of Crimea uh, happened seven years ago, and uh, we have this date, uh, February 26, uh, 2014, which is the day of resistance of uh, Crimea. On February uh, 26, 2014, Russian forces, uh, headed by Aksionov, brought people to the Supreme Council of Crimea to force deputies to vote for secessions from Ukraine. Um, then our 10,000 Crimean Tatars and pro-Ukrainian Crimeans uh, went to the building of the Crimean parliament to prevent this from happening. Uh, you know what happened after and that congestions near the Crimean parliament, parliament claimed the lives of two elderly people. And uh, for the occupying authorities, this was a good reason for a crackdown. Uh, we know also the case of uh, February 26, which was recognized as a political by many human uh, rights activists and embassies of Western countries uh, than uh, nearly 200 Crimean Tatars and pro-Ukrainian activists were interrogated, and one of the members of Majlis, Aftemchigos, 
was uh, convicted during this, uh, uh, during uh, next two years. So what happened then uh, during next months, um, the new Crimean government uh, banned the leaders of Crimean Tatars, Mustafa Jamilev, first of all, and Rifat Chubarov from entering the territory of Crimea. Then Ukrainian director Alexentsov, you know him, was arrested and sentenced to 22 years. And you know that it was a happy end story. Um, and a lot of uh, people joined this campaign. And I think maybe uh, you too. Uh, so over the next year of for the occupation authority started all the independent media from Crimea, journalists of the Black uh, CTV company and the center of uh, journalistic investigation actually became a territory with now with uh, when people ask me as a journalist, as a editor in chief uh, in di from different countries, what could you tell about what actually is going on with freedom of uh, of speech in uh, in the occupied Crimea? I <laughs> I uh, answered them there is no there is territory without freedom of speech and um, it's uh, totally. Uh, totally propaganda, and you know that uh, we have this Russian propaganda narrative and also Crimean propaganda narrative, uh, which is outstanding. <laughs> uh, so, um, I think that here we can open the floor, and my question, my first questions will be to Alim and Anton. Uh, uh, I'm very interested in what's going on in occupied Crimea now, uh, because Oles. I uh, told you um, before that this topic is not so much popular in, in Ukrainian media, unfortunately, and uh, it's very hard to keep attention. Uh, first of all, when we had these searches, uh, like uh, every every week, every single week, every single day for the last five years or even seven years. And people are uh, really tired of the, from bad news, not only from Donbass, Crimea. So Alim, Anton, uh, maybe we'll start with uh, Anton. Uh, could you tell us what's going on in Crimea now? Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Um, thank you very much, uh, Sergei, for uh, having the ability to, as a possibility to talk. And uh, you were saying about your book of Mustafa Jamilev, uh, which you wrote uh, together with Alim. And I remember how I, I myself bought it. I think somewhere it was either New York or The Hague. I think that I was one of the first Ukrainians to buy this book. So I had a pleasure of, 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 of having this book. And of course, I think that uh, drafting the books uh, about Crimean Tatar national leaders uh, is very important for keeping attention to the issue. So I myself uh, am working for the government, uh, actually for the president, for his office, uh, working on all the issues related to the Autonomous Republic of Crimea and the city of Sevastopol. And of course, uh, trying to answer your question, I would maybe start with the main idea that Crimea is a gray zone. Crimea is a territory where law does not exist where legal rules, legal norms uh, do not regulate relations between people, where uh, you can uh, easily find yourself in a trouble in a situation when uh, the so-called legal um, officers or the uh, law enforcement officers come to your house at four o'clock in the morning and make illegal searches. And then you are given by the court uh, conviction for let's say 20 years or 15 years for participating in so-called terrorist or extremist organization so you are taken to jail for 20 or 15 or 17 years for committing no crime just for having some counteraction for having some interrelations with people who talk about religion human rights civil rights and so on and so forth so this is, I think, the main picture and the main idea which uh, I would like to be sounded today. Because concerning the particular human rights uh, violations in Crimea, I'm sure that our audience can read in um, uh, United Nations General Assembly resolutions. But in general, uh, it is very important for the audience all over the world, and in, in particular in UK, to understand that 
Crimea is a gray zone and that Crimea has no future with Russia because Russia doesn't care about Crimea, Crimeans. Russia wants it as a military base, as a military prasdar. So I'm sure that our Ukrainian citizens, Crimeans, perfectly understand that their future may exist only with Ukraine. I thank you. Um, also, uh, Anton, can I ask you about um, this uh, strategy of Russian strategy, uh, the population replacement in the occupied Crimea, uh, which is a violation of international humanitarian law, you know, and um, you know that Ukrainian diplomats and officials do not give the exact number of Russians who moved to Crimea, but uh, could you explain what's going on and how many people according to you to your uh, maybe some uh, uh, da data from uh, international organizations uh, because um, ac according to the uh, uh, interviewed human rights activists that might entail several hundred thousand people uh, please yeah, uh, thank you for this question Sergei. Uh, well first of all of course uh, we cannot and we will not support and rely on any data provided by the Russian Federation, because of course we understand that this data will not be true, as uh, a lot of people just didn't play, didn't change the place of registration. So they, they, they really live in Crimea, but have a place of registration, let's say in Moscow. And there is a big, uh, there is a big list of people who are not listed in Russian official statistics, like military personnel, prosecutors, judges, policemen, and so on and so forth. Uh, official statistics of the Russian Federation uh, talk about at least 200,000 uh, of uh, the people uh, of the Russian citizens who were transferred to Crimea. Uh, official UN statistics, I think the latest number is approximately 170,000. But again, official UN statistics is based on Russian statistics. And I would never use these statistics officially. Uh, and of course, we do not have our own concrete statistics as unfortunately for seven years we work in exile. But we do believe that at least there can be half a million of people, so 500,000 of the Russian uh, citizens who were moved to our Ukrainian Crimea. And Russian Federation uh, fosters, facilitates this movement by uh, making, uh, by imp implementing governmental programs, specific uh, programs for the newcomers, so-called, to Crimea. And of course, we consider such a, uh, uh, su such a transfer of Russians to Crimea a forcible transfer, and we consider it to be a war crime under international humanitarian and international criminal law. And this may be the most systematic war crime committed by the Russian occupation authorities in Crimea. But I also want to mention that, in my opinion, this, uh, this uh, of course, has an influence on demographic situation. So they change demographics of, of Crimea. Uh, they, uh, include, they include to Crimea the Russian citizens, and they make Crimean Tatars, Ukrainians, the citizens of Ukraine who reside in Crimea permanently, to leave Crimea if they are not okay with the occupying regime. So this is really the uh, demographic change of population. But I think that this is a part of the wider problem. The Russian Federation wants to change Crimea, not only demographics. They want to change landscape, uh, natural environment, cultural heritage. They want Ukraine to forget about Crimea and they want Ukrainians to forget about Crimea. Thank you, Anton. Ali, um, could you give your points about uh, occupied Crimea seven years after occupation? Yeah, thank you, Sergei. Good evening, everyone. Thank you for Ukrainian Institute in London for uh, this opportunity uh, to share my thoughts about Crimea, about situation in Crimea, and um, Anton said about uh, about um, a population population uh, replacement. Said about many uh, important things that we have in Crimea now. And 
you know, during these seven years, uh, human rights organization documented more uh, 2,000 uh, cases of human rights violations on the peninsula for the last seven years. And among them, uh, a lot of cases uh, of uh, people who place under detention and uh, 200 uh, children have been left without uh, father care. But these violations in ju uh, is just a, a top of iceberg. Uh, we have a, a new reality in Crimea, and this new reality built, uh, uh, built in a few tendencies. Uh, first tendency is militarization. You heard a, a lot about militarization, about a regular army, about uh, that Crimea has been turned from, uh, from a touristic place to uh, a military base, but uh, I want to say about militarization of uh, consciousness, because, uh, for example, from uh, school, from uh, child gardens, Russia tried to make a new uh, Russian citizens in Crimea. For example, I just uh, I just give two examples in this case. Uh, for, uh, 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 Yun Army movement in Crimea, in schools being to popularize a military ideology, uh, foster a special bond between young Crimean citizens and the Russian army, and also promoting the cult of violence and war. Uh, second case, uh, so-called cadet classes in Crimea, and the goal of this cadet uh, uh, classes. It's to create uh, from the children uh, born before the occupation uh, future soldiers who uh, who are able to fight against the, their homeland Ukraine for the interest of uh, occupying country. Uh, one uh, next tendency is the making of a new Russian identity. Uh, what it means. Uh, Russia uh, uh, destroys the Crimean Tatar and Ukrainian tangible and intangible heritage uh, that do not fit uh, for Russian ideology. Uh, example is a hand palace in Bakhtisarai. Hand palace is the uh, most important Crimean Tatar um, tangible heritage in Crimea. And uh, now, Russian authorities have recently uh, embraced on so-called renovation works, when the authentic materials are being replaced with the modern arms completely. More, more Russia conducts illegal archaeo archaeological uh, excavations on the peninsula. And one more, it's about language. Crimean Tatar and Ukrainian language in Peninsula. The Crimean Tatar language uh, is one of the UNESCO uh, list as a uh, vanishing languages. In Crimea, only uh, 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 three percent of all students study in Crimean Tatar language, and the share of uh, uh, students studying in the Ukrainian language has been reduced uh, 50 times in the seven years. Uh, last but not least, and uh, uh, sorry, uh, and Anton said about it, about population replacement, but I want to give a broader context. Uh, it's the third time when we have this colonization uh, by Russia in Crimea. Uh, what it means? Uh, after uh, the first time after uh, first annexation uh, of Crimea by Catherine uh, Great in 18th century, and uh, before this annexation in Crimea, uh, lived 95% of Crimean Tatars of the whole population. The second uh, mm, the second uh, such uh, replacements is the 
Stalin's deportation, 1944, and today we have the third population replacement and colonization. And when some of people ask me why Crimean Tatars against Russia, why Crimean Tatars against uh, Russia uh, authorities, uh, I just give these facts for them. Thank you. Thank you, Olim. Uh, thank you, Anton. My next question is, we don't understand why this situation is very dangerous for Ukrainian defense and security. And for us, it's more than questions of defense and security. Uh, but at the same time, I would like to ask you, could you explain why the situation is dangerous for European countries, for European security, for European um, future, and uh, not only European? Maybe I will open the floor with Anton. Yeah, thank you very much, Sergei. Uh, well, actually, I think uh, that there is really this a lack of information about the things which are going on in going on in Crimea, uh, in uh, let's say in Western societies, and uh, when um, international organizations uh, or members of international community do talk about Crimea, they mainly talk about human rights violations. Uh, of course, it's very important. Of course, we do appreciate talking about human rights uh, violations in Crimea. Uh, within the framework of international organizations, but Crimea is a much wider problematics. So talking about security, I would just briefly uh, introduce several of the most important issues uh, from my point of view. First of all, in Crimea, everything is ready to uh, have their nuclear weapons. So the storages for nuclear missiles are ready to have these missiles every day. And Russian Federation has built the so-called carriage bridge over the carriage strait. And Russian Federation built this so-called carriage bridge not because of the needs of civilian population, but because of military logistics. And we may find ourselves in Europe, in whole, not only in Ukraine, one day with the real proofs and facts about nuclear weapons in Crimea. The second issue, in Crimea, there are the newly created uh, warships of the Russian Black Sea Fleet, which are able to carry uh, the caliber missiles, which can fly approximately 2,000 uh, kilometers. So this is a range of Southern Europe, Central Europe, Northern Europe, 2,000 kilometers. And this missile, caliber missile, can also have a nuclear element there. So it can be done technically. So, uh, and again, Crimea is a military base for waging military operations in the Middle East, in particular in Syria. This is a principal base of the Russian Federation from where all the Russian warships start, practically all start to, to Syria for Syrian ports. So having such a threat in the eastern side of Europe, I believe, is really an important threat to the security, not only of Ukraine, but of a wider European region, namely Central European, uh, Eastern European, Southern European region. And this is very important. And talking about security, I would also mention briefly now uh, the issue of environmental security. Environmental security in particular the threat which is done by the Russian occupation authorities to the Sea of Azov, to the Black Sea, may have, ha have long terminated harm for the whole Black Sea and maybe Mediterranean region. So that is why I'm sure that uh, the instruments and mechanisms which we are now launching, in particular the one which is called Crimean Platform, I'm sure that the audience is, is acquainted with it, uh, the, it will be used in particular to talk not only about human rights, but about the Crimean pro problematics in wider uh, range. Thank you, Anton. Aline? It's, you know, it's hard to uh, add something after Anton, <laughs> uh, but I will try. Uh, <clears throat> look, uh, Situation in Crimea and temporary occupation of Crimea, it's not only issue for Ukraine. 
it's not only an issue for uh, Crimean Tatars. It's an uh, issue for all civilized world. Why? Uh, because Russia has, in fact, declared war of the entire this world. And how it's going? Uh, illegal reshape of international borders, pro propagate uh, instability, breach international law, interfere in into elections of European countries and the United States. And uh, also spread the disinformation. Also, we have a case of shutting down MH17 and also a nuclear uh, weapon, uh, Anton said about it. And it's a broader problem. It's not even a problem for European countries. It's a huge problem for all of this democratic world. That's why uh, we not only need support from another countries, we need this understanding about it. Thank you, Olim. Uh, uh, Anton mentioned this Crimean platform, and we have a big expectations for this new initiative. Uh, Anton, could you please explain for people maybe um, never heard about it, uh, the main uh, the main issue of Crimean platform, the main idea of Crimean platform? Uh, yes, so uh, talking about Crimean platform, uh, we shall start with the fact that officially, this is a number one priority of Ukraine's foreign policy for 2021. So Ukraine prioritized a Crimean platform throughout any other uh, foreign diplomatic and international um, events. Uh, Crimean platform is the incentive of uh, Mr. President Volodymyr Zelensky. Uh, and this incentive is born with the idea that uh, actually talking about uh, Ukraine's uh, regions which face the aggression of the Russian Federation, uh, we see Donbass, uh, which does have the Minsk and Normandy formats. Uh, we will not now talk about the efficiency or the quality or the speed, uh, because actually this is not my competence, but we do have these this international mechanisms and platforms to talk about Donbass. When we talk about Crimea, we have nothing. Uh, and of course, uh, it was important for Ukraine, because Ukraine is a victim of this military aggression of the Russian Federation, to come to our foreign partners with the idea, with the incentive of establishing the Crimean platform. So Crimean platform is seen as an uh, international uh, platform where Ukraine, together with foreign partners, can talk on the issues related to the occupation of Crimea and can talk about the projects also, which can be implemented by our foreign partners and friends and colleagues in order to facilitate and to make the occupation and reintegration of Crimea come faster. So uh, we do anticipate that Crimean platform uh, has a good future. The uh, inauguration summit uh, is scheduled for 23rd of August in Kiev. A lot of work is now being done for uh, this summit to, to be a successful one. Uh, the signing of the final document of uh, the political declaration, uh, we anticipate also is going to take place uh, on this uh, inauguration summit of Crimean platform. And uh, of course, for us, it's very important that Crimean platform uh, does not finish with the summit on the 23rd of August, but that Crimean platform does have capacity to work permanently and uh, to cover the issues which relate to the occupation of Crimea and the consequences of the occupation of Crimea. Uh, very important, as I just said briefly before, that uh, within the framework of the Crimean platform, we're going to talk about Crimea with our international partners and friends, not only in relation to human rights, but in relation to everything, militarization, security, environmental aspects, cultural heritage. So. 
talking about Crimea uh, in broad sense. Thank you, Anton. And uh, dear participants, uh, dear listeners, uh, we are waiting for your questions. Actually, we have now two questions in our chat, and I'll be very happy to have more. Uh, and we will move forward. Uh, um, and Alim, what are your expectations of Crimean platform? Uh, you know, uh, for me, it's a very important issue, issue because Crimean platform, it's uh, our our own answer about uh, about a question uh, for the question, what doing Ukraine for for Crimea and for the occupation of Crimea, uh, because you know during uh, uh, several uh, years a lot of our <clears throat> uh, international partners uh, asked us, uh, okay you want to solve this problem, you want to deoccupy Crimea, but what uh, the steps uh, during your state in this, uh, in this way? And now we have this uh, Crimean platform and it's not just, you know, uh, <clears throat> one uh, event uh, mm, that will be one on, uh, of, uh, <clears throat> during a uh, year, uh, but it's a permanent uh, uh, work uh, and permanent uh, activity uh, in uh, different uh, spheres. And I don't say it about the spheres. That's why I say that uh, for us, it's a good signal. And also it's a good signal for uh, our citizens in occupied territories, and it's a bad signal for Russia. Thank you, Alim. And we have actually this first step uh, that before 2020, uh, we have this only one strategy, Crimea as Ukraine, and it was an international strategy of Ukraine. But now we have the document, uh, our uh, and I think that Anton will represent this document. We have now the strategy of the occupation of Crimea. Uh, it was published last week. If I'm not mistaken, uh, please uh, correct me. Anton, could you describe how you work for this document? I know that um, a lot of people participated, a lot of human rights organizations, and you work almost one year for this document. Uh, and why this document is important for now, not only Ukrainian issue, but for an international representation of Crimean issue. Yeah, thank you for the question, Sevgili. And I think that maybe here uh, I'm going to talk a little bit more um, than answering the, the last questions because of really the importance of this issue. Um, I'm really grateful to Alim for him pointing out that actually uh, talking about international support to the Crimean issue, uh, Ukraine needs uh, ourselves to show that actually we are working on Crimea and that our strategy of work on Crimea is not only uh, a billboard Crimea is Ukraine or official motto slogan, but that we are working in order to facilitate this deoccupation and reintegration happen. So this is the issue now of priorities. I mean, you can, you can work and only say that Crimea is Ukraine or you can, you can do actions. And uh, having the strategy of deoccupation and reintegration of Crimea ready and signed was one of the priorities of our team. When we came into office, we fixed several priorities for us. And this was, was one of these priorities. Uh, so, uh, because we consider that having a strategy as a main political framework document is important for the state. This is about the capacity of the state. This is about the willingness of the state to work on Crimean issue. How can we say that we are strongly working on Crimean deoccupation if we don't have one document which uh, includes all the issues and all the positions of the state of Ukraine concerning Crimea? So this document was worked out, I think, in a year uh, on the basis of the National Defense and Security Council of Ukraine. Uh, where the working group was established. And the working group encompassed uh, and envisaged 
a lot of representatives from all the principal groups who work on Crimea. So everybody was engaged. The working group received, I think, something as 1,000 uh, commentaries and uh, track changes to the document. Uh, and finally, the document was uh, adopted on the, um, on the sitting, on the meeting of the National Defense and Security Council on uh, 11th of March. And on the 24th of March, Mr. President Volodymyr Zelensky adopted the strategy in the form of his decree. So the strategy officially is now in force. Um, the ones who read in Ukrainian can find this um, strategy officially in the websites of the president and of the Verkhovna Rada of Ukraine, but we anticipate that the strategy will be translated into English uh, so that our foreign partners can read it and analyze it. We also would have several events on the strategy even this week. So uh, we hope that they will be interesting both for Ukrainians and both for our foreign partners and colleagues. So this strategy is a public policy statement, is a big framework document, which includes all the positions of the state concerning Crimea, starting from non-recognition of the so-called Russian citizenship, and finalizing with the actions of the state of Ukraine towards uh, the deoccupation and reintegration of Crimea. So of course, by having this document, we have not uh, finished our job. Mm -hmm. We need to uh, adopt concrete uh, laws of Ukraine. We need to adopt concrete measures, which are important here. But what we do now, and I think that this is important to mention, we create this legal framework legal grounds, legal basis for this work on the occupation and reintegration of Crimea. And really this didn't emerge before. So I'm really happy with that. And I'm really happy to be the part of the team which now works uh, on these issues. Thank you, Anton. Thank you for your team. First of all, I know that it was very difficult, but extremely important. Uh, Job. Thank you. Thank you for your job. Uh, and we will continue with Alim because um, Anton described as uh, government strategy, the strategy of the state. And with Alim, I will be very happy to talk about cultural strategy. You are deputy director of Ukrainian Institute, which represents cultural uh, side of this problem. Uh, could you explain the importance of cultural diplomacy in that issue, issue of crime, Crimean occupation or Donbass, um, and uh, actually your plans uh, as a as an institute um, to to bright this topic, to make it more uh, wider for not only people who are interested on in it. Yeah. Thank you, Sergei. Uh, the Ukrainian Institute is a public uh, institution affiliated with the MFA of Ukraine, and our mission is to strengthen Ukraine's international standing through the means of cultural diplomacy. And uh, <clears throat> during uh, this uh, 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 past half of year, uh, the Ukrainian Institute, in our activities, we have de developed the Crimean focus. In this way, we want to raise the issue of the temporary occupied Crimea and strengthen the voices of those who recently defend the Ukrainian peninsula, both in Ukraine, uh, sorry, in Crimea, and also on the, the mainland of uh, Ukraine and, of course, abroad. We implement uh, such activities uh, through cultural diplomacy projects. We prepare artist artistic, public, and information campaigns. And uh, these are projects also will strengthen the Crimean platform. And I just give a uh, few examples of such our projects into 
in Crimea direction. First one, it's uh, also, uh, of course, we, uh, we will create a cultural program of uh, Crimean Platform Summit. It will be, uh, as Anton said, in, in August. And now we prepare and after that implement a human rights and art project a documentary interactive performance Crimea 5M. In uh, Ukraine and abroad with the uh, involvement of public uh, figures on the documentary stories of political prisoners uh, of Crimean Peninsula. Uh, first of all, civic so journalists and activists. And we want to draw uh, the world's attention to political repressions and uh, persecution in Crimea and uh, through uh, such artistic form. And uh, it, it's uh, one of the uh, steps of soft power a strategy of Ukraine abroad about Ukraine, uh, about Crimea. Uh, one more project and it's project we implement uh, uh, one month ago with our partners, uh, Ukrainian uh, project, uh, we are Crimea name. We show Crimea through the eyes of famous people uh, who can't be there because of uh, uh, occupation. Uh, and we ask, Jamala, uh, famous uh, singer, uh, Mustafa Jamilev, leader of Crimean Tatars, Alex Sintsov, a uh, former political prisoner and director, and Akhtem Sitablaev, also director and actor. And they tell about Crimea, about their native land. Uh, they uh, tell the stories about Crimea with uh, uh, modern technologies. We use VR technologies and uh, all of the people can just uh, use their mobile phones and uh, you uh, can see their villages, their um, uh, you can hear the stories about Crimea and it's very emotional component of uh, in our work and it's important to give uh, through this cultural diplomacy the messages and signals about uh, about Crimea of course and 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 maybe maybe I will uh, yeah, I will say about one more project. It's a project um, about Crimea. It's a small two minutes um, uh, video relics when we explain uh, about Ukraine, about Crimea and uh, for uh, international audience. And we make some key highlights about history and culture in brief style. In modern world, it's very important to give the information in, in brief and bright style. Thank you. Thank you, Olim. Uh, and I think that we are ready to involve uh, our listeners, our participants to our discussion. And I open the floor for your questions. And the first question will be, uh, um just a moment um from sasha dovzik uh, please uh could you join us and um ask your question uh hello can you hear me right uh, yeah, there hear seems you. to be a problem with my video camera so i'll have to just be a disembodied voice 
Uh, right. Thank you very much for keeping the spotlight on Crimea and on this issue. It's extremely important. And thank you for all your thoughts. I'd like to hear a bit more about the environment and the current like unfolding ecological crisis in Crimea. And if you could relate this to the situation in Ukraine, the situation in the larger world, uh, what it means for people who remain in Crimea, what it means for the community of Crimean Tatars, it would be really good to hear. Thank you. Anton, maybe you? Uh, yeah, sure. Uh, so uh, about uh, uh, natural environment and cultural heritage, uh, this is really the big issue, which is not so sounded uh, internationally. And of course, we hope that uh, it could be and it will be sounded more, in particular with Ukrainian Institute uh, headed by Alim. Uh, attempts to 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 make Crimea sound more broader uh, in in international arena. So actually, uh, to uh, talk about the main issues. So first of all, there is a big problem with the um, coastlines of Azov Sea and Black Sea and Kerch Strait due to the building of the so-called Kerch Bridge. So the uh, there is even the criminal proceedings in Ukraine concerning the threat and damaged caused by this construction to the uh, environment of the sea there. Um, moreover, uh, what does Russian Federation do? They uh, try to make the, um, the, the uh, place uh, of uh, natural reserves smaller, uh, and they try to use parts of natural reserves in Crimea for business purposes. In particular, you may have heard about the devastation of park in Foros, where a lot of uh, centuries-old trees are cut off to build their uh, places for leisure of Russian uh, statesmen to, 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 to live there or to reside there during the holiday season. Um, another issue is that some natural reserves, like for instance Opuk National Reserve Park, is used for reasons of military trainings. So military trainings with Russian missiles, complex like Baal, Bastion, are taking place in, in the natural reserves, in the forests, let's say. Um, during the construction of the so-called Tarida Road, a lot of uh, also um, green uh, plants and trees were cut off. Um, so this is a big problem, uh, and, and due to the issue of the sea, we do believe that the issue of the sea makes this a problem not only a Ukrainian one, but a European one, and a Mediterranean one, and not only the Black Sea one. Uh, and talking about cultural heritage, Alim uh, brilliantly mentioned the issue of um, uh, Bakhchisarai Khan Palace. So just uh, a small insight what they do. Uh, they make a repairing, so-called repairing of the palace, and during which they take some authentic details and replace them with the new ones. So the authenticity, the original spirit, is unfortunately being lost. And we believe that this is the issue of attention of international community, due to the fact that this is really the cultural heritage of the, of the people, of the indigenous Crimean Tatar people, and the most important one. So this is just briefly to give some some main, uh, uh, from my point of view, main insights on this. Thank you. Thank you for the question. It is very important to talk about them. Thank you. Thank you, Anton. Alim, do you have something to add? Yeah. Yeah. Thank you for this question, and, and I also added about um, Crimean Tatar community and about. Um, what is important for Crimean Tatars, as in mainland in Ukraine, of Ukraine, and also in Crimea. Uh, <clears throat> uh, you know, a few years ago, we make some, uh, made some um, research about communities, and um, Crimean Tatars said that uh, who are living in Lviv, uh, Kherson, Kiev, in, in other places, it's very important to uh, 
have a, 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 a job search and also housing. But uh, one more important issue that important for all of Crimean Tatars is uh, to save identity. Because for Russia, strong uh, Crimean Tatar and also Ukraine identity in Crimea is a question of their national uh, instability. I don't know how to uh, s s say it. And what they uh, do in Crimea? Uh, for example, now uh, in uh, public discourse in Crimea, we have um, a new concept of so-called Crimean people as it actively being uh, used in public uh, discourse by Russian authorities, by Russian opinion leaders, and uh, its attempt to imaginate all inhabitants of peninsula, regardless of their origin, this, uh, the, their uh, self-identification. And if you remember in Soviet Union was uh, the same situation when there was a concept of Soviet people to erode the national identities of the people. That's why uh, uh, Crimean uh, Ukraine, uh, Ukrainian uh, uh, cultural heritage, Crimean Tatar cultural heritage that do not fit of their ideology, it's, uh, it's a question of destroying of uh, these identities here. Uh, thank you, Alim. We will move forward. Uh, we have two questions from Anna Reit, and I know that Anna is ready to join uh, this discussion. Anna, uh, can you switch your video? And you, if you're ready, please ask your questions. The first, your question was about cultural heritage, but I think the next one about Crimean economy is uh, economy is very interesting for all people, all our participants. Good evening. Thank you all very much for. Um, mm -hmm you know, being so interesting um, on a, such an important topic. Uh, I, I wanted to know, just to, just quickly, to be briefed on what's happening happened to the Crimean economy over the past few years, and what's happened to tourism and local businesses, and um, I don't know what the situation, I'm out of date on what the situation is over electricity and water, and whether mainland Ukraine is still cutting Crimea off periodically, and also I'd be interested in knowing what effect on the local economy the new Kerch bridge has had. Um, and the second question, it's probably something you're getting on to later on, is the whole diplomatic picture and how much uh, diplomatic support the Tatars are getting from Turkey. Yeah, um, I, I will be happy to try to answer the question on, on, on Crimean economics. Uh, well, uh, there is no intercourse uh, of Crimea now with um, international and foreign uh, stakeholders, uh, namely companies, uh, because uh, it's uh, forbidden for international companies to work in Crimea under the different international sanctions. Of course, there might be some examples when we uh, in Ukraine our law enforcement agencies, for instance, find out some instances of the Western companies working in Crimea. And of course, then uh, our diplomatic missions uh, start to deliberate with the host states about the, the fact that actually um, uh, every economic intercourse uh, with Crimea is now illegal uh, and shall be deemed illegal both under international law and under national law. Uh, so how how does uh, the how what do some companies do? Is they uh, create a Russian legal entities, which do not have any legal uh, connection to the multinational mother company. Let's say multinational uh, company is established in capital A, but this multinational company from capital A has no legal. Uh, uh, no legal connection to limited liability company registered somewhere in Krasnodar on in rostov na which operates in Crimea. So unfortunately, we do have these cases, uh, but we try to fight them. Uh, again, for many, many internationals, 
it's understood that it's illegal to work now uh, in Crimea. Concerning the uh, uh, water supply and electricity supply, from, so there is no uh, water supply and electricity supply from the territory of the mainland Ukraine to Crimea now, so nothing at all. Uh, we know that um, electricity supply go from uh, Russian Federation uh, through the bed of the sea, through cables. Uh, and water, well, there is no water, uh, apart from the water which is from Crimea itself. Uh, concerning other economic uh, issues, uh, the Crimea is donated from the federal budget of the Russian Federation. Mm -hmm. So Crimea does not earn money itself. Crimea only gets more than 80% of Crimean budget Crimea gets from Moscow, from governmental program. Um, prices in Crimea are very high for daily products, for the products which people need, like meat, potatoes, fruits, vegetables. So these, the prices are as high as in Moscow. And the, and the level of wage and salary and pension is not so high. Um, and maybe the last thing for me to mention is that, of course, the seaports are closed officially under Ukrainian law and the airports also. So it's illegal for foreign ships, vessels, and for foreign aircraft to enter um, uh, Crimean ports and uh, airports. Uh, and about tourism, well, there is no international tourism. There is only uh, Russian inside tourism. So Russians come to Crimea to spend vacations, holiday season there. But a lot of these Russians who come to Crimea for holiday season, they don't spend money. They don't buy the tour. They get this governmental, uh, it is called in Russian Putovka, uh, yes, governmental uh, official um, uh, without any payment. They, get, they go to sanatoriums. Mm -hmm. So this is bad because uh, Russians don't spend so much money on tourism as the Russian Federation wanted. So uh, economically, the situation is, is, is very bad in Crimea. Do we have any idea what the unemployment rate is, for example? Uh, again, we don't trust any Russian, uh, any Russian statistics. Uh, Russian statistics says that everything is fine and there are a lot of places where people can work and there is no problems. But from our uh, citizens who reside in Crimea, we hear that it's hard to survive in Crimea. It's hard to live for the salary which you can get there. And that actually, it's really a hard task. Can I slip in a last one? I was interested on the um, sanctions busting and in Kiev, you know, you're trying to track down, um, you know, follow up on companies which are doing this. How often does that happen? How, how, you know, how big a problem is that? Uh, rather often, uh, and now this work has been made more, uh, I would say, faster. Now the National Defense and Security Council is very active in uh, putting sanctions both on companies and both on natural persons, on individuals who uh, commit uh, violations in temporary occupied Crimea. Uh, MFA is very active, Ministry for Foreign Affairs is very active. Uh, in working with our foreign uh, partners in order to uh, uh, make sanctions. Uh, just briefly, uh, several days ago, I think two, uh, two days ago, Canada and Australia uh, imposed new sanctions in relation to Crimea. So we believe that the sanction regime uh, will remain in place until the uh, deoccupation and reintegration of Crimea. And apart from sanctions, I think that it's important also to understand and to sound here that Ukrainian law enforcement agencies really precisely look over the activity of foreign companies and foreign individuals in Crimea. And this can result in criminal uh, responsibility, in criminal charges under Ukrainian law. And then you understand all these instruments like Interpol and others 
So uh, we would suggest foreign companies not to think about working with uh, occupation administration of the Russian Federation in Crimea. Thank you. Alim, do you have? Yeah, I will add um, my answer uh, uh, to your question about um, uh, Turkey and about Crimean Tatar, uh, Tatar's relations. Uh, as you know, in Turkey, live uh, from uh, three uh, to five million Crimean Tatars. And it's a huge diaspora, uh, Crimean Tatar diaspora. Uh, <clears throat> it was due to the first annexation of Crimea, and a, a lot of Crimean Tatars left Crimea and um, uh, came to Ottoman Empire. And now, uh, during these seven years, diasporas uh, around the world, Crimean Tatar diasporas, we are united. And uh, we also make such a one um, one huge organization that coordinate all of uh, activities of diaspora. It's important uh, issue because before uh, 2013, 2014, it, it was just, uh, just you know, uh, not a systematic war. Mm -hmm. uh, second question about uh, Turkish authorities. Uh, and uh, also about Erdogan. Uh, you know, for Erdogan uh, and Turkish authorities uh, does not recognize the Crimea as a, a Russian territory. And, uh, but we of course know that uh, Turkey and Russia ha has, uh, have a, uh, has a huge um, economical uh, relations. But for example, for um, Erdogan, it's, will be, uh, it's important now to be a, uh, like a mediator between Russia and Ukraine in uh, uh, Crimea issues. One, uh, one fact, uh, really, when uh, when uh, was released uh, Artem Chigos and Ilmi Umerov, uh, former political prisoners, uh, Erdogan was uh, this uh, mediator, mediator between uh, Ukraine uh, state and uh, Putin. And now in the uh, Crimean platform, in uh, this issue, uh, Turkish um, authorities are very active. And I hope uh, this active uh, action, uh, this active word also will be uh, active actions. Thank you. Thank you, Olim. Uh, let's go ahead. Uh, we have uh, another eight questions. And uh, um, please, Irena Ternyuk from BBC Ukrainian. I know that you have questions to uh, Anton, please. Hello, can you hear me? Yeah. Hi. Yeah. Hi, Sergil. Hi, Anton and Alim. Uh, thank you very much for a, a very interesting presentation. Um, I have a question to Anton because um, you partially uh, answered it when you spoke, uh, when you answered Anna Reid's question. Uh, we have been talking, we have been hearing statements about the need or pr the prospect of deoccupying Crimea or reinstating Ukrainian sovereignty over Crimea in some future, and this future seems to be uh, ever so remote in the face of Russian, Russia's blatant uh, violation of international law and deafness to the calls uh, of international community. And yes, sanctions do work, but Anton, what specific steps do you envisage on top of sanctions from Western partners of Ukraine that could facilitate this eventual uh, reinstatement of Ukrainian sovereignty uh, over Crimea. And Alim, you know, Mustafa Jamilev, uh, the hero of your book, uh, he um, 
doesn't remember the original Surgun uh, deportation of May 1944. He was a baby then, but in a way he is in exile. When do you envisage the return of Mustafa Aga to his ancestral home? Thank you. Uh, well, starting with a question on um, concrete steps. Uh, well, we do anticipate that Crimean platform uh, is not only an instrument to sit and to talk. Uh, of course, it's important that Crimean platform is this international platform for coordination of action uh, regarding Crimea uh, for uh, Ukraine and international partners of Ukraine. But we believe that it should go further than just talking and, and, and coordinating. What we, I mean, it's all very, you know, draft now and uh, about a lot of issues we cannot talk now publicly. But what did we uh, try to figure out and what we believe is important is that Ukraine should come up with, I call it a menu of projects. Uh, to our international partners uh, for Crimean Platform Summit. This menu of projects can include different projects, starting from small tactical ones and finishing with bigger ones. And uh, of course, this does not go about, I don't know, military operations or etc. Uh, but this might go about protection of identity about which Alim was talking, uh, environmental issues, healthcare issues for Crimeans in the mainland Ukraine, educational issues, and many, many, many others. And we do believe that uh, our foreign partners can choose uh, the, the, the project which might be okay for them. And with uh, implementing these projects, uh, we will, uh, I'm sure that uh, making the day of return of Ukrainian flag to the peninsula uh, come, come faster. So I do believe that as Ukraine came up to our international partners with the idea of Crimean platform, it might be a good reason and a good time for Ukraine to come up with a uh, menu, a collection, like, look, this is what we think. This is what we can suggest. And you are free to choose. Thank you for your question. Uh... Thank, uh, thank you for your question also. Uh, you know, I saw Mustafa Ra recently. He uh, jokes a lot and full of energy. But, uh, you know, it's a fundamental uh, question. Here. Why uh, about deportation about and about situation now? Uh, why Crimean Tatars? Why it's such important for us to uh, uh, one more time back to Crimea. No, uh, uh, because uh, Crimea, it's uh, a place of strength of uh, Crimean Tatars. I have not been my native Crimea for seven long years. You know, during this time, a whole new generation managed to go to school. And a temporary occupation has been going on for seven years, separa separating the peninsula from the future. And uh, these seven years uh, since Russia decided to redraw the world map. And these seven years uh, for uh, through the struggle, indifference, and vision of common future, we are on our way home. And in Crimea, hundreds of thousands of our, uh, our com com uh, compatriots do not give up, uh, give, uh, give up positions. And they are waiting for us. And and I understand and uh, that now we have uh, not a sprint, we have a marathon. And I know that we will 
definitely our comet. And we will definitely meet in our Crimea. And you know, uh, among Crimean and Tatars, we say it because we always, always come home like a boomerang. Inshallah. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Rana, for your questions. Thank you, Alim. Thank you, Anton. Uh, we have two questions from uh, Yuri, uh, Yuri Bender, uh, and actually two questions about uh, trading. Yuri, if you're ready, you can ask. Yes, um, just one question actually from, from me. Um, okay, okay. Um, thank you very much to the Ukrainian Institute. Thank you, Sevgil. Thank you, Anton, Alim, for keeping this vital issue very much alive. And I'd like to look a little to the past for inspiration to the future about Crimea. And if we look to the back to the 13th century, to the um, medieval history, and I think that there were some really vibrant ports then in Crimea, Soldea, um, Olbia, where um, and we read about these in the old chronicles, the, um, the papal envoy, William de Rubricus, um, sent by the Pope to the Mongol emperor. He passed through these ports, they sold goods there, and then they made money for the rest of their voyage. Um, Marco and Mafio Polo on their way to Be um, Beijing, they also passed through um, the, the Crimean ports. And the descriptions we see of the vibrancy of these ports, how they were, how they were bringing in the silks, the spices from China to, to sell into Europe. And I'd like to ask our panelists, I'm very impressed by this Crimean platform. And um, you, you both, Anton and Alim, have both said that the, the Russian policy is to militarize Crimea, that they only care about this as a strategic military base and nothing else. Would it be possible that we could see the Ukrainian government set up a, a very different narrative about commercial investment in Crimea for the good of the international community, for um, building some ports there, investing in ports which would be very attractive to but not to obviously to Crimean citizens but also to the powerful international partners particularly China and other nations in Asia uh, yeah thank you for your question Yuri uh, yes uh, looking back into history of Crimea is is really a magnificent way to understand the the region to understand how the region is rich in history, culture, economic uh, history, trade culture, and how the Russian Federation tried to erase this after the first annexation of Crimea in 1783. Because if we look at, uh, at, at uh, the uh, Crimean ports, uh, which were uh, the part of uh, Ganuya, and if we look at uh, Crimean Hanate uh, as a state, these were economically very, very powerful unions, and uh, Crimean Hanate was actually a European state, uh, not a nation one. And uh, how the Russian Federation, after the first annexation, tried to erase this that before Russians in Crimea there was nothing, and only Russians were those who brought culture, um, uh, I don't know, morality politics, public administration issues to Crimea. So uh, about ports in pre precisely in particular, I want to mention that uh, actually ports were developed by Ukraine and were used by Ukraine heavily uh, in Yalta, in Yopatoria, in Theodosia. Uh, so ports are important. And I'm sure that after the deoccupation of Crimea, Ukraine will rely on Crimean ports a lot. In particular, before um, uh, occupation, Crimean ports were used for agricultural sector. So grains, uh, vegetables, fruit, 
from uh, all over the territory of Ukraine uh, were uh, then transported to Europe, to Asia, to Africa from Crimean ports. So we do believe that after the occupation, Crimean ports can be used and it would be economically beneficial for everybody. But of course, uh, during the, the uh, occupation, officially the ports are closed by Ukraine. And as we see now, uh, there is pretty much no activity in these ports. Yes, but, but we don't hear a narrative from the Ukrainian government about uh, a post-occupation strategy from Crimea. And this would engage the international community and the citizens of Crimea. I think the same is true with Donbass as well. This is a, there is a lot of potential in Crimea which isn't discussed by, by the Ukrainian government. And they could get a lot more of the world on their side if they included the international partners in this discussion. Why do you think the Ukrainian government is so reluctant to construct this narrative? Well, uh, maybe I, I will try to answer your question. Of course, um, it's, it's not easy to talk about Crimea in this relation. It's easier concerning Donbass. And we, uh, you, you know, or you may find an information online that there is a conception now of the economic development of Donbass. And there is the desire of the government to establish the so-called uh, belt of benefit or belt or, of profit. Uh, but this is going to take place on the territories which are not occupied. So Kramatorsk, Mariupol, uh, Severodonetsk, uh, Slovyansk. So uh, the, the cities in Donbass which are controlled by Ukrainian government. So Ukrainian government does now have a strategy how to economically, actually, I think that this project is implemented with the assistance of UK embassy here in Kyiv. Uh, so concerning Donbass, there are these ideas, how to make economically prosperous the governmentally controlled part of Donbass so that the other part of Donbass can look and understand and feel the difference. Concerning Crimea, the situation is harder because we don't control the whole territory of peninsula. So we cannot do something in Yevpatoria that Yalta will look at and say, well, look, guys, Ukrainians are better in doing this or whatever. Uh, so we do have strategy, we do have ideas concerning the uh, regional economic development in Kherson region, the adjacent region to Crimean territory of making some economic things there. But I think that if you uh, open the strategy of the occupation and reintegration of Crimea, when it will be translated into English, because now it exists only in official version in Ukrainian, you will find the issues on economics there. So we started to go through this track. And I think that the strategy, when it will be published in English, will be interesting for the English speaking um, audience to, to read and to analyze. Well, I'll be happy to read it in Ukrainian uh, too. Please send me the me, link. So uh, I, can... excuse okay. me, I will send the link right now in the chat. Okay, yeah, okay. Uh, dear participants, dear speakers, we uh, times go by very quickly, so we have almost 10 minutes, and I think that we should move forward. If you have a, a question, please ask uh, directly Anton. It's not hard to find him on Facebook, so uh, you can you can join the um, this and uh, Robert Blinkley and uh, your question was about blockade of Crimea. Please, you can join. Hello, um, thank you very much to all our our speakers, panelists, for this important discussion. Um, you've already discussed a bit the situation with water in you in Crimea, and my my questions about that. Um, something that Ukraine did very soon after the start of the occupation was to stop the water supply through the North Crimean Canal, which had provided, I think, four-fifths of the water used in the, in the peninsula of, of Crimea. Um, I'd be interested to hear from you 
What do you think the effects have been of that water blockade? And have the Russian occupying authorities been able to compensate for the loss of so much of the water supplies to Crimea? Uh, thank you. And Anton and Alim, I will ask you be very short. <laughs> very... Yes, sure, Sergei. Uh, so um, I wouldn't call this a blockade. I will call it rather that Ukraine stopped or temporarily stopped the water supply through the northern Crimean channel. Um, we have all the data and all the statistics from all the state agencies from Ukraine, which say that there is enough water in Crimea for the needs of civilian population. And Crimea existed uh, even in 12th, 20th century without a northern Crimea canal and without the water from Dnipro. So there is enough water for civilian population. This is the data uh, as of 2014 from Ukrainian government. What is the problem is that Russian Federation misuses the water. So they spent water not for the needs of civilian population, bar, but for the needs of military bases and infrastructural projects. So we will not renovate the water supply until Crimea is occupied. Uh, the water supply will be renovated after the occupation. And we see now that the issue of water supply is pretty much the, maybe the only question which the Russian Federation cannot solve itself. So it doesn't have technology, it doesn't have ideas, it doesn't have the way how to solve it. Thank you, Anton. I just to add that, uh, you know, um, uh, uh, two years ago, we conducted research in uh, Crimea re regarding uh, values and needs of, uh, of Crimea population. And a lot of our respondents that, of course, pro-Ukraine respondents say that uh, we will be passionate about the question of water, question of econ uh, some economical questions, and so on, so on. But uh, what they say, and it's uh, crucial uh, for uh, me as a researcher and, uh, um, and uh, as a cultural uh, manager, that uh, uh, part of Crimean population uh, perceives Ukraine as a part of European uh, values, and for uh, part of Crimean population, Ukraine is a, a, a civilizational choice. When we have a freedom, when we have a, uh, a transparent rules, and so on, so on. Uh, people say that living without freedom is deadly. And for me, it's uh, important because uh, uh, now people in Crimea now uh, uh, they know how to live in Russia, and they can compare. And uh, Russia with this uh, uh, authoritarian uh, regime, it's it's deadly for uh, not only for identities, it's deadly for uh, human beings in Crimea. That's why, that why uh, it's Ukraine. Thank you, Robert, for your question. Uh, I think that we can take two more questions and then we'll finish our discussion. Uh, uh, so Martin Locker has uh, two questions. Martin, are you ready to ask them? Yeah, sure. Hi. Yeah, my name is Martin Laura. And um, yeah, thanks so much, Alessia. Thanks so much, uh, Sefko, for organizing this. Uh, I've been very, very, very much intrigued. Uh, it's so reassuring to see seven years later that there are still people who care about this deeply. And uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's absolutely horrible the, the way that it just seems that, um, well, say on the European continent, which is sort of where, where I come, I come from. Uh, so not, not the Anglosphere, but the European continent. It just seems like people have forgotten about the Crimea, all the Russian disinformation 
it's just been going on just sort of every country uh and you know in the europe divided by languages it's a sort of divide and conquer approach it's, it's been absolutely horrible to watch this in the last seven years uh and i guess yeah public opinion so in the last one and a half hours or so we have been talking almost exclusively about geopolitics, about nuclear rockets, about uh, investment in, in ports and uh, in the water supply. And those are very important questions, but they're not going to win the battle in the mines, the battle on Twitter. And I mean, in that regard, I'm very thankful to Alim because you have been sort of redirecting the discussion to the human aspect every time. And the Ukrainian Institute has been doing such amazing work, especially with that beautiful, beautiful, fantastic website. Uh, the, the one way is sort of scroll down and you and you get all the stories. Uh, I, 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 I struggle to recall the, the URL at the moment, but yes, uh, I've just been struggling with the with the angle on this, right? Because how how do you get uh, the European continent, which as the sort of closest geopolitical entity, uh, you know, to the Crimea, to Ukraine? Uh, well, public opinion counts. Like we have to keep the pressure, right? And so, in this context, I just wanted to ask for your opinions about like what. Do you think, like, what is your opinion on, would, would you be able to draw any parallels to say the situation in Xinjiang where the Yugos are being uh, so horribly oppressed by the Chinese regime? Like what's an angle that could sort of convince people to deeply care about this as deeply as we do? Thank you. Thank you, thank you, Martin. I think that maybe Alim is, is responsible for human dimension here, but uh, I, I would only mention that the work of Alim uh, previously in Crimean House uh, and now in the Ukrainian Institute is, is just marvelous and splendid, and we are happy to have such people working on these human dimension issues. But of course, just, just to say that people are, are important and uh, we understand that when we talk about the occupation we talk about reintegration of people so ukraine does a lot in order to reintegrate crimeans you can find that info in the article which is which was sent here in chat for instance in the issue of education of crimeans so it's important for us but i think of course alim will cover the issue much much wider uh, thank you martin for your question um, you know uh in uh, Ukraine Institute, our strategy is to build long-term uh, mm, uh, connections between Ukraine and uh, other countries. And in Crimea issues, we also, in <clears throat> different countries, we have a strategy and uh, every year we uh, cover more and more countries. And we work with our, not only with our counterparts in this country, we are working with uh, opinion leaders, with uh, journalists, with artists, with the academic sphere, of course, uh, to explain the modern role of Ukraine and to explain uh, uh, not only the history or, or traditions or cuisine of Crimean Tatars, to explain the sort of Crimean Tatars, to explain uh, our vision of future and our modern uh, situation. And that's why uh, this, uh, it's about, the, uh, not only about raising uh, awareness, it's important, of course, but it's about this human component uh, through this st uh, story, through the uh, this emotional uh, things uh, explain the situation, explain the political agenda uh, of Ukraine and uh, explain uh, the Crimean Tatar agenda also. That's why we, are, we, we combine our work with uh, these modern technologies, with the uh, uh, creative uh, 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 some uh, things and also with the art component and human rights component. And uh, you know, also we made a lot of research. 
to understand our audiences, to, un to understand uh, uh, what material, what topics, what tools we should uh, use on this country. That's why I hope that uh, uh, during this year and uh, during the uh, ne next few years, we'll have um, much more better uh, coverage of Ukraine topic into the world. We, uh, uh, last, last sentence. We are young uh, institution, uh, governmental institution in Ukraine, but uh, uh, we so optimistic and we have a lot of drive to change uh, the attitude and to uh, share uh, in, uh, information and stories about Ukraine and Crimea especially. Thank you. Thank you, Alim. So we are close to the finish line. And uh, the last question uh, will be from Maria. Maria? Hi, thank you. Thank you, Sergio. Um, thank you all very much for this extremely informative discussion. Uh, my question is about the role of the media in moving towards the reintegration of Crimea and also of the occupied territories in the Donbass. And I've heard quite a bit about the, the TV channel DOM, um, especially in with regard to Donbass, and I know that there are some new TV satellites that have been put up um, in the Donbass. Um, and my question, I'd actually love to ask you, Sevgil, um, as, a, as a journalist, what you think of Dom's programming and whether you think that they have any chances of reaching out to audiences in Crimea. Um, and also, if there's time um, to hear from Anton about um, what role um, Dom plays in the overall strategy um, of the government towards Crimea. Uh, thank you, thank you for your question, Maria. Uh, my personal opinion, uh, it depends from um, journalist, it depends from content, and it's very hard to make this content interested, interesting for um, your audience. Uh, for example, uh, we uh, have this problem in Ukrainska Pravda too. Uh, actually, Ukrainska Pravda is one of the leading newspapers in our country. I mean, online newspapers, uh, more than one uh, million readers per day. But at the same time, for example, we um, got some reports from uh, occupied Crimea, from court uh, um, in occupied Crimea, people from Hizbut Tahri. And I saw that it was like 4,000 views, like 5,000 views. At the same time, uh, we have news, uh, more than 100,000 views per day. So uh, not so much important. So uh, this year we decided uh, to make uh, to make this project uh, with uh, news uh, cover, covering news uh news you didn't uh you you just paste uh paste uh, during uh, annexation of crimea because you know seven years ago it was very hard to uh to to live in this informational area after maidan after what was going on in crimea and we uh left a lot of important information for crimea and uh, didn't understand actually what happened here so, uh, and we got good results from this project, more than 110,000 views, which is extremely uh, amount of views for the project from Crimea. So it depends from content and you should, you should uh, do everything possible to make this content creative, to make this content uh, interesting for a lot of for a lot of people so but i think this channel i mean uh, atar channel and dom channel uh, a very important signal for european partners and for russia that um, ukraine ukraine uh, is ready to fight for these territories so not only in um, for example we didn't uh, we didn't cover this topic today but uh, in international humanitarian law side but an informational side too. So from this point of view, I agree this that uh, DOM channel and other channel and the informational uh, policy uh, in occupied territories are extremely uh, interesting issues for uh, for covering uh, 
what's going on in occupied ter territories and uh, i hope that uh, uh, for example, Alexei Matsuka, who is editor in chief of uh, Dom, uh, I think he is a talented journalist uh, and maybe talented uh, media manager. So, and it will be a successful project. So, let's see. Uh, thank you. Thank you for your question. 